year is 1861. The South secedes from the Union. Fort Sumter is fired upon. President Lincoln calls up the Northern men to crush the Southern rebellion. The eastern United States becomes a battlefield as the great armies of Lee, Jackson, and Grant march across the land, making shrines of places like Manassas, Shiloh, and Gettysburg. Many people think that Oklahoma, which was Indian territory, had little to do with the Civil War, that the Indian continued to work his farms and watch the white man fight. But nothing could be further from the truth. civilized tribes in Oklahoma were largely southern in sympathy. These Indians came from the south, and they lived the same kind of life as did southern whites, some with small farms, some with slaves, plantations, and fine homes. Once the Civil War began, the Confederacy made treaties with the Oklahoma Indians, who had large numbers of horses, cattle, and young men that the South could use. The Confederacy also wanted Indian territory as a buffer between Union Kansas and Confederate Texas. At the start of the war, the North withdrew all their troops from Indian territory, leaving the Indians with no protection. But Albert Pike, Confederate Indian Commissioner, soon signed treaties with the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole nations, and with the Wild Plains tribes in Western Indian Territory. He even signed a group of Osage led by Captain Black Dog. The five tribes of Oklahoma became full allies of the Confederacy and agreed to furnish troops and supplies. The Plains tribes agreed to raid Union settlements in Kansas and Colorado instead of Texas. The Oklahoma Indians had many reasons for siding with the South. They felt that the U.S. government had forced them from their homes in the East, and they felt that the federal government had now abandoned them by withdrawing all of their troops from Indian territory, and most importantly, their cotton economy and agricultural way of life were so closely tied to Texas and the South that they really had little choice. Just as in the Civil War in the East, the people of Indian Territory had long been split into different political factions. And when the war began, these factions chose opposite sides. The man who would lead the Union Indians of the Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole tribes was a former Creek chief named Apothayahola. To get away from the Confederates, Apothayahola decided to move north into Union-held Kansas. Around 6,000 Indians, with their slaves, started north in November 1861, pushing their livestock ahead of them. Apothayahola also took the entire Creek tribal treasury. Colonel Douglas Cooper from Mississippi was the commander of Confederate forces in the Indian nations in 1861, and he led the pursuit of Apophiahola with some of the five tribes' ablest leaders, D.N. McIntosh and Stan Wadey. Between Yale and Old Keystone, Oklahoma, Cooper struck Apophiahola's men in the first major battle in Indian territory, the Battle of Round Mountain. The Union Indians fought fiercely, but were driven northward in two more battles, Chasto Talasa, or Caving Banks, near Sperry, and Chestanala, near Skyatu. Cooper almost destroyed Apotheohola's column at Chestanala, 
and the scattered Union survivors barely managed to stagger into Kansas ahead of Stan Waite's rebel Cherokees. Eighteen sixty two saw the Yankees moving into northern Arkansas. Confederate General Earl Van Doren decided to consolidate his troops and meet the Federals head on. Included in Van Doren's army were troops from Oklahoma under Albert Pike. Pike's troop consisted mostly of Stan Wadey's Cherokees and the 9th Texas Cavalry. Van Doren hit the Yankees at Pea Ridge, Arkansas in March of 1862. Pike's troops were on the far Confederate right, facing most of the massed Union cannon. The Indians charged and captured a battery of Yankee artillery. At about three o'clock in the afternoon, Pike learned that Van Doren's field commander, General Ben McCulloch, had been killed, so he assumed command. Early on the morning of March 8th, the battle was decided by the superiority of the Union cannon, and the rebels began a retreat toward Fayetteville. Stan Waite's mounted Cherokees were among the last to retreat, covering the beaten army's withdrawal. After the Union victory at Pea Ridge, President Lincoln ordered Union General James Blunt to organize 2,000 Union Indians to march south and retake Oklahoma. Many of these Union Indians were veterans of Apotheoholus flight to Kansas and were eager to go back to Oklahoma and take back their land. In addition to the Indians, Blunt would send units from Kansas, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Indiana. In all, over 6,000 troops into Indian Territory. On the southern front, General Pike was ordered to hold his position and harass federal troops in Missouri, Kansas, and Arkansas. Pike built a new fort on the Blue River near Tishomingo, named Fort McCulloch which would be a major Confederate base. He sent Stan Waitey north to Fort Davis, which was across the Arkansas River from old Fort Gibson, and ordered him to raid into Yankee territory. Waitey fought several battles in the area. In May of 1862, he pulled back to Cowskin Prairie to rest his troops. General Blunt, realizing that the Confederates were widely separated, decided to start his invasion by cutting Wadey off from the other rebel forces under Colonel James Clarkson near Locust Grove, Oklahoma. The Yankees caught Wadey at Cowskin Prairie with no scouts or pickets out and completely surprised him. Wadey's men managed to get across the Grand River to safety, but the Federals captured a large amount of supplies and several hundred horses. This was one of the few times that Wadey was decisively defeated. Blunt decided to move next against Clarkson at Locust Grove. In a battle not unlike the East Wilderness Campaign, the Federals routed the Confederates. The area was so rough and brushy that the troops were forced to fight mostly on foot in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Clarkson lost over a hundred men killed, a hundred captured, and was himself taken prisoner. After the Union victory at Locust Grove, Cherokee Chief John Ross decided to defect to the Union cause. Ross, always a Union supporter, had been pressured into signing the Confederate Treaty by Waitey and other pro-Southern Cherokees. He sent word to Blunt's field commander, William Weir, that he would surrender if the Yankees would come to his home, the Rose Cottage, and get him. Weir did, and Ross moved northward to safety behind Union lines. 
Later in the war, Stan Wadey would retaliate for Ross's defection by burning the Rose Cottage to the ground. Early 1863 saw Blunt's column withdraw once more into Kansas, and most of the Confederate troops in Oklahoma encamped in the Choctaw Nation around Scullyville, near present-day Spyro. Douglas Cooper had withdrawn his troops from Fort Davis, leaving only a small force to garrison it. Union Colonel William A. Phillips, who had put together a third Indian regiment, was ordered by Blunt to make an extended scout through Northeast Indian Territory around Fort Gibson. Phillips quickly took Fort Davis and burned it to the ground. Since Phillips had destroyed Fort Davis so easily, Blunt decided to invade Oklahoma once again. The Yankees re-garrisoned near Fort Gibson, renaming it Fort Blunt, moved a large detachment of troops in and began to launch raids into Confederate Indian Territory. Fort Gibson now became the major Union base of operations in Oklahoma. This park and the surrounding area on Honey Springs that feeds into Elk Creek just north of Shakota is the scene of a battle often referred to as the Gettysburg of the West. Here, General Cooper was stopped in his greatest attempt to push Union forces out of Fort Gibson in northeastern Oklahoma. This pavilion, erected during our day, was the site of Cooper's headquarters. And his army was encamped about two miles up the Texas road, waiting on reinforcements from Arkansas. But Blunt decided to strike first. The Confederates held their ground for over two hours in a driving rainstorm, fighting with knives and clubbed muskets, since their gunpowder had been ruined by the rain. Around 2 p.m., Cooper was forced to order a retreat. With the Texas Cavalry and McIntosh's Creeks fighting a stubborn rearguard action, Cooper crossed the Canadians and met the reinforcements that had come too late. Honey Springs had forcefully reasserted the Union hold on northeastern Indian territory. <laughs> 